In the deep sea, there are many types of impressively big creatures. This is because when it comes to water in the deep, the lack of sunlight makes it super cold and high in pressure. As a result, underwater creatures have to adapt their bodies to survive. But this survival tactic isn't limited to just fish and squid. With the power of the deep, any creature has a chance to evolve into a giant kick-ass freak of nature. Don't believe me? Then let me introduce you to the world of giant isopods. These adorable alien rock babies mastered the skill of growth and are cool, ancient, and important creatures in the deep. So, where in the world can these creatures be found? Surprisingly, you don't have to travel to a different planet or embark on a thousand year journey to find them. I mean, you wouldn't see one walking down the street, and the safest way for us to see them right now would be to go to one of the museums that actually has them. But when it comes to those in their natural environment, they're actually quite abundant in the deep sea. They can be found in separate areas of the ocean, such as the cold deep waters of the Atlantic, around areas such as Brazil, the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, and the western United States. When it comes to isopods, they can have crazy amounts of species in their indicated groups. And the underwater giants are no exception. Their family consists of several different species that are similar but somehow different enough to be in different classifications. But instead of overwhelming you with every type, we'll just talk about the main ones we know of. There are four main species of giant isopods in this region. We call them Bathynomus obtusus, Mirae, Maxiorum, and Giganteus. B. Giganteus is the best known isopod of this entire family, but we'll cover more about them in a bit. The remaining isopods in their family can be found in the Indo-Pacific region of the sea. From what we know, Eastern Australia is the area with the biggest number of different species. But because these creatures live in deep waters, there may be a lot more species than we know about. One thing that's certain is they don't tend to travel a wide area of ocean. They like their own spots and don't like heading into other farther areas. So the ones in the Atlantic never meet the ones in the Indo-Pacific. So that's where they live. Cool, cool. But let's address the elephant or the isopod in the room. Just how big are these fellas? Well, it depends on the species of giant isopod. They're split into two groups, giants and super giants. The giants are between 3.1 to 5.9 inches, or 8 to 15 centimeters. And the super giants are between 6.7 to 90.7 inches, 17 to 50 centimeters. The largest recorded size of these creatures was 20 inches, or 50 centimeters, given by the largest species of this family, B. giganteus. For perspective, that's roughly the size of a cat. If we compare these giants to their smaller isopod counterparts, you can see why they're absolute mammoths for the family they come from. The average land isopod only reaches about 2 inches, or 5 centimeters. If they were to meet their cousin in the deep sea, they'd definitely feel some envy. I mean, imagine, walking down the street and all of a sudden you see this sci-fi looking creature walking across the grass. You'd probably pass out. I know what I would do though. I'd steal it. What? You don't think these creatures are adorable? But look at it. That's what I call a kissable face. Seriously though, these isopods could be cousins with how similar they are to each other. Comparing these giant isopods to their smaller counterparts, the woodlouse, shows us that they have a lot in common despite their size difference. Their bodies are both shaped the same way. They're what we call dorsoventrally compressed, which basically just means they're flat and long like fluffy little pancakes. Both of these isopod species are protected by a tough, rigid exoskeleton made up of several different overlapping segments. This is what helps them curl up into a ball when they're on the defense. Why exactly can they curl their bodies up? That's because their underside is surprisingly soft and squishy, so having this ability helps protect them from potential threats. But honestly, these are some pretty lucky creatures when it comes to natural predators. They don't have a lot of meat on them, they have a literal shield as a body, and because they're at the bottom of the ocean, not many predators would bother going after them. They also tend to be brown or fairly pale in color, which can help them blend in more with the clay or mud that they like. Along with their hard shell, they also have their giant alien-like eyes. That shiny dark appearance they have is thanks to the 4,000 tiny units or facets that form together to make the surface of their eye. This is referred to as Amatidia and can be found in other species of animals such as insects and crustaceans. Unfortunately, due to their dark environment, most of these creatures are blind or have really bad eyesight. That doesn't mean they can't navigate around the ocean though. They use a combination of olfaction and chemoreception in order to interact with the world around them. This is the common sense most animals have in order to survive, so it doesn't necessarily matter if an animal can't see well visually. Instead, in the case of these isopods, they use their two pairs of antenna on their head to touch and see things. These antenna are pretty long and large, and they have chemoreceptors on them that help navigate around the ocean and detect any sort of chemicals in the water. The rest of their anatomy consists of seven pairs of undivided thoracic legs, or walking limbs. The first set of these limbs are modified claws that they can easily move. They use it to tear up food and bring it to the four sets of jaws they have. The lower area, their abdomen, has five other segments called pleonites, which each have a pair of swimming legs that help them move across the ocean floor. Those flat discs at the end of their underside are the respiratory structures acting as gills so they can breathe. 
is. Even though they're usually on the seafloor, they're actually really good swimmers and can glide through the water with ease using their fan-like tails. So, are you impressed by these creatures yet? No? Well, what the heck? They're trying as hard as they can to be cool little guys. Isn't that right, Bathy? So, yeah, this is Bathy, one of the many Bathynomus giganteus that lurk in the deep. Did you know that over 80% of these isopods live in deep waters between 365 to 730 meters? They're not the only species of giant underwater isopods that like being super deep, though. These creatures are all excellent scavengers in the deep sea benthic environment, which is the lowest possible level of water. That's not to say all of them hate being closer to the surface though. They can be found from the fairly shallow sublitoral zone at around 170 meters, all the way down to the cold bathyal zone at 2140 meters. Some specific species that are known to reside in shallow areas include B. Mirae, which can be found between 22 to 280 meters, as well as a lesser known species known as B. decemspinus, decemspinosus, which lives between 70 to 80 meters. And then there's B. doderline, doderline which can be found in areas as shallow as 100 meters. Many species can be found in both areas though. For example, the deepest record for any giant isopod is 2,500 meters, which was claimed by B. Kinsley, but this species can also occur in areas as shallow as 300 meters. Really goes to show that a lot of animals are good at adapting to their environment. In regions with both giant and supergiant species, the giants mainly live on the continental slope while the supers mainly live on the bathyal plain. Some studies suggest the reason for this separation could be because certain isopods can't handle extreme lower temps. But part of me suspects it might have something to do with an inside isopod turf war. Giants basically yelling at the supers, GET OFF MY LAWN! STAY DOWN THERE, YOU DANG SUPERS! I mean, I could be wrong, but you never know. Now, as for the ocean temperature they like, most underwater isopods prefer extremely cold water, between 37 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, or 3 to 13 degrees Celsius. For comparison, something like a pool is about 78 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, or 26 to 28 Celsius. So, yeah, pretty cold water that they like to be in. Some of these guys don't like it if it's too cold though. B. Doderlini, Doderlini. for example, decides, I'm gonna stop eating now if the water gets lower than 37 degrees Fahrenheit or 5 degrees Celsius. So they tend to avoid areas or depths they can't handle. And I mean, I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to be swimming in freezing ass water either. As the water gets deeper and colder past the limit, less isopods can be found. But sometimes bathynomas don't give a fuck. Those that lurk in the colder temps tend to be bigger so they can deal with the deep, dark cold. And because they're solitary, they don't even need other isopod buddies with them. So. We've established that these creatures live in the deep sea, but a question that raises is, what do they eat? Because as we know, resources and food are very limited in this region of the sea. Well, they have a pretty good gig going on. They're like the janitors of the ocean, except the trash is their food. Generally, they can be considered scavengers of the sea. They feed on dead animals like whales, fish, and squid. And in one case, they even fed on a giant dead alligator that was given by humans. This might seem kind of nasty, but think about land animals that do the same, such as crows, vultures, hyenas, etc. These types of scavengers play an important role in breaking down deceased animals, and these underwater isopods are no different. It benefits the ecosystem and feeds some underwater creatures in need of food. But although they mostly eat dead things, they can hunt as well. That's right. This underwater janitor is also a potential killer. They sometimes try and attack small, slow-moving animals such as sea cucumbers, sponges, radiolarians, nematodes, and other creatures that live in the benthic zone. If they're super lucky, sometimes they can even catch live fish. Another way they get potential food is by f***ing with humans. They're known to attack or go after trawl catches, those giant underwater nets that catch fish. Isopods do this life hack pretty often, and they're not exactly humane when they're going after the trapped fish in the nets. In one instance, for example, a giant isopod was filmed attacking a much bigger dogfish shark in the deep water trap. This mother literally latched onto this trapped shark's face and started eating it. Like a raw ass living face. So, yeah. They're pretty cool, but definitely a little bit weird too. But hey, you can't judge when it comes to a need for food. I'm sure you'd eat a shark face too if you had to spend most of your life deep underwater with limited food. Bathy's favorite or most eaten food in the ocean has been studied to be fish, followed by cephalopods and then decapods, which was discovered through a study that examined the digestive contents of 1,651 different bathy specimens. Before you start fearing one of these creatures will eat you, don't worry too much. They don't show much actual aggression or desire to eat people. I mean, you could drop a corpse in the deep sea and see what they do, but that might have some ethical problems. 
That would be one way to donate your body to science, I guess. But yeah, as for living people, they don't even want to bite into us given the chance, so I think humans are off the menu for now. When it comes down to it though, these are pretty much the only options giant isopods have to get potential food. And these occurrences with dead or live fish don't happen every day for them, so when it does happen and they find food, they'll eat as much as they can even if it ends up making them immobile for a bit. Amazingly, like a lot of those giant deep sea fish, in the case that no food can be found for a while, these isopods have adapted their bodies so that they can easily last a very long time without consuming food. They can survive over five years without eating anything in human captivity. At this point, I'd say you've already earned your badge of giant isopod knowledge. You must feel very proud of yourself. It's a truly great accomplishment, and when these guys decide to evolve to their final form and take over the earth, I'm sure they'll appreciate some supporters. But there's one other thing I want to cover, and that's their history and diversity. Let's take it back to the very beginning of these creatures' existence. In case you didn't know, they're old as fuck. Taking a look at the fossil record shows us that giant isopods lived more than 160 million years ago, before the giant continent we called Pangaea broke up. Keep in mind that humans first appeared around 2 million years ago, so yeah, these guys definitely know how to survive throughout the centuries. Now, it might not be important to some, but when it comes to animals, I like to shine light on the people who first discovered them. It's a great accomplishment, and I know I would love to discover a new creature on this earth, especially if it looked this freaking cool. Seriously, these isopods look like aliens. Peaceful little janitor aliens. So they were first seen and collected in 1879 by an American scientist and engineer named Alexander Agassiz. He discovered and collected a juvenile male bathy from the Gulf of Mexico. Then he brought it to his friend, a French zoologist named Alphonse Milne Edwards, who named and described this genus. The scientists and public were so pumped after hearing about this creature, they were like, Bro, that is so cool, it came from the deep? Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Anyway, here's some tea. Seriously though, this was an exciting discovery. At the time, people didn't know just how deep the sea was. And even after some recent evidence, many didn't believe that there were parts that lacked so much life and sunlight. So this new deep sea animal definitely helped the scientific community. So cool. They were discovered a while ago. But eventually more and more species of these underwater isopods kept popping up. Different types in different areas. But how do you compare and study different isopods that live in different places and ocean depths all over the world? Well, the first step is to set up underwater traps filled with bait. So, some Australians did this. They set up traps at 50, 100, 200, 300, 400, 600, and 1000 meters deep. They put these traps all along the east coast of Australia, as well as Mexico and India. As a result, they got over 2000 specimens from 5 different species. What these traps revealed about the giant isopods was pretty interesting. It was discovered that the Bathynoma species had a much more diverse genus than past scientists understood. Although they kept the same isopod form, there were slight differences in their body that made them unique. Some bodies were thin while others were wider. Some species had spines that curved more, and others had much flatter spines. Even their antennas, claws, and eyes were somehow slightly different from each other. But these are pretty small differences when it comes to evolution and how long these creatures have roamed the earth. Realistically, they should have much more visible differences but a reason they don't is most likely because of the environment they live in. The cold, deep water and low light most likely contributed to their lack of evolution. But honestly, I'm not really surprised. It basically just proves they're perfect as is and need no more improvement. These sweet little alien babies are my favorite janitors of the sea, and they definitely pass Mother Nature tests of endurance. I hope this video was able to make you appreciate them too, because we live in a truly wonderful world with fascinating creatures of history, and learning about the wonders of life can really put a perspective into just how awesome and fascinating it can be.